Welcome to City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Mary Margaret Wheeler Weber, a member of the Friday Forum Board and the producer of today's program. For more than 100 years, City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people have come together to find solutions to our region's biggest challenges. Today, we're a diverse network of people who are eager to learn, connect, and share ideas for a better Oregon. Thank you for joining us at the Sentinel Hotel, where thousands of people are watching, listening in, and participating by radio, TV, and online. Listeners are here via X-Ray FM's website and radio stations, 107.1 FM and 91.1 FM. Live viewers are watching on KGW's website, Facebook feed, and news app. And TV viewers will watch a recording of today's program via Open Signal's community media television stations. We're incredibly grateful for the support of our media partners in bringing Friday Forum to our community. In addition to City Club's valued media partners, our volunteers and staff are, enable us to put on Oregon's best civic programs week after week. A special thank you goes out to TriMet for sponsoring today's program. Please join me in showing our appreciation to everyone who has made this event possible. In a moment, we'll hear from Bob Jundev. But first, let me introduce Steve Novick, who will moderate today's discussion. Steve is a former city commissioner who recently returned to his original field, environmental law, after 22 years absence. He's a longtime city club member and a fellow member of the Friday Forum Board. But first, we'll hear from Bob Jundev, who, for more than 30 years, has led the fight in Oregon to improve opportunity, access, and fairness for Oregonians with disabilities. Bob will be retiring later this year. During his time as the Executive Director of Disability Rights Oregon, Mr. June Depp helped close the Damage State Hospital and the Fairview Training Center, ended segregated employment and sheltered workshops, pushed for the largest investment in safe and accessible transportation in state history, and challenged the use of force against people with psychiatric disabilities. Mr. Jundep has served as a member of numerous state policy groups in Oregon and was recently appointed to the Social Security Advisory Board. The rights and experiences of people with disabilities is something that touches all of us, one way or another. For myself, the work leading to the closure of Damage State Hospital is something I feel great and tender appreciation for because of my memories of visiting my father there as a child. I know that many others share in my personal appreciation of Bob's accomplishments. Please join me in welcoming Bob June Depp. Hi, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank the City Club and Mary Margaret and Steve and everyone who's come out today to, to talk about disability rights. Um, this is um, uh, billed as 30 years of um, reflection, I guess, in a sense of where we're going to go from here. But when I think about it, it takes me back even further because um, when I first came to Oregon in 1976 as a VISTA volunteer lawyer, I'd come out of the East Coast as a New Jersey boy, and I ended up in the Klamath County Legal Aid Office, about as far from New Jersey as you can imagine. <laughs> and boy, did I start having to learn some stuff. And one of the things I learned about was what it was like living in a small Oregon town if you didn't have any money and you had uh, challenges in terms of getting around, in terms of getting employment, in terms of just getting the supports that you need. I moved on from there and, and worked in Coos Bay and in McMinnville in small legal aid offices and, and eventually ended up back in Portland where someone came by my office one day and said, hey, how would you like to be on the board of the Oregon Developmental Disabilities Advocacy Center? which is today called Disability Rights Oregon. And I said, yeah, I don't have anything else to do. I'm just doing housing law here. That sounds kind of interesting. And so I showed up one day at the first board meeting, and what I found was a group of very excited and angry people who were mostly parents of people with disabilities, many of whom were either in Fairview Training Center or were living in the community with their children and adult children who had no services whatsoever, no services and no assistance whatsoever. 
and they were kind of pissed about it. Uh, they, in, in the entire conversation was around what can we do to, to affect this? There aren't any laws that we can use. Isn't there some way to go at it? One of the people sitting at that table who was particularly uh, articulate was someone named Barbara Roberts. Uh, and I, I was very impressed by her. I think she was a new um, uh, member of the Oregon legislature at the time. At any rate, uh, that's where I started my learning curve. That's way back in 1981. Uh, it was a long learning curve because this world is pretty complicated, is what I found out. <clears throat> and what I'm going to talk about a little bit is, is some context for that. So I'm going to take us even further back in my now 15 minutes or so. Uh, to, because one of the things I'm asked fairly frequently is, well, people with disabilities, aren't there sort of all sorts of different people and why is that a category and why do people have civil rights? And I can take us back into Oregon's own history just to illustrate why there is a group of people who are defined as having disabilities and why those people have been systematically over time segregated and discriminated against in our society. And I'd like to go back to 1923 because Oregon has always been a cutting edge state when it comes to science. Uh, we don't like to fund things here, as you know. <clears throat> But we're very willing to adopt the latest science. And the latest science at that time was, was something called eugenics. Because back then, as a result of some people thinking about Charles Darwin and interpreting it very weirdly, uh, decided that what the task of society was is to genetically purify the race. So that we would all be tall, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, good, Americans or Oregonians. And so we passed a law that was a mandatory sterilization law at that time uh, in order to make sure that we would be able to steer society towards a more perfect genetic pool. And so what I wanted to do was read to you the people who were authorized for sterilization. Uh, and what that meant was that if the state took custody of you under these categories, that you could not get out of an institution unless you agreed to be sterilized. Okay, here's, here is the description right out of the statute. Uh, here, the quote, feeble-minded, insane, epileptics, habitual criminals, moral degenerates, and sexual perverts, you know who they are, <laughs> who are a menace to society. This is a category of people who, for whom the Oregon Board of Eugenics was given the authority to orchestrate the elimination of over time from our society. Uh, that board, anybody want to take a guess when that board was finally dissolved? 1983. So here's Bob coming in from New Jersey in 1976. What do I know? And we still had the Board of Eugenics. When I started on the Board of Directors of Disability Rights Oregon, we still had the Board of Eugenics. Uh, and when we sat down and tried to figure out what we were going to do about Fairview Training Center, which is the place where people were still being sent, one of the largest institutions of its kind in the country, uh, we still had the board. Uh, and in fact, just last week, we had a testimony at the Oregon State Capitol uh, about something called the Fairview Trust, which is when Fairview was closed, there was some money that was set aside from the sale of, of the property to be put in trust to help people with disabilities find housing and to, and to have the supports that they need in order to integrate fully into the community. And you know what, that money hasn't been spent properly over the years and the legislature has raided half of that money and so advocates want to get it out of the state and put it into a community foundation and that's what the bill was about. And testifying at that hearing was a woman who I love who was born, was raised at Fairview Training Center 
forcibly sterilized before she could be released, but she has lived in the community successfully for years, a wonderful person, and she talks about her experiences there of, of waking up in the morning and hearing the keys on the side of the, her keepers and being terrified of them and trying to avoid them at all costs. That is her experience. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit really quickly because I'm, I'm taking 30 years and condensing it down now into 10 minutes. <clears throat> um, just a few of the things that, that have affected uh, my work and some of the things that have happened over the years because even though I've kind of started out with a bummer presentation, things have gotten better. Uh, and so when it comes to the services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, we joined with the, the U.S. Department of Justice. We sued the state. Uh, we closed the facility. When the facility was closed, there was a waiting list of over 7,000 Oregonians who were eligible for uh, developmental disability services who were not being served. We filed another lawsuit called the Staley lawsuit in which we argued that people had a right to um, apply for Medicaid community services, which they always had, but Oregon had not done it, and that if they were found to be eligible, they had a right to services in the community uh, as a result of a Supreme Court case called the Olmstead case. Uh, and uh, that case was settled and re resulted in a brand new service sector for people with developmental disabilities and in entitlement, if you will, even though that word has been given a bad rap, uh, that, that people could get uh, those services in the community and it took years to roll out and become a reality for people, but it's in existence, but that has followed through and been in existence today. But one of the things that we found out, because things are slow to change, they just are slow to change, is that many people ended up in what I call day institutions. So rather than just sort of being in a big institution where they spent 24 hours a day, they, got, they, they were at home, but then all day they went to an institution which was called a sheltered workshop. Uh, and so uh, people were supposedly being trained to work. This was, this was the whole idea behind it. It was sold as tra work training, but it's not work training. What people did is they sat around and they sorted buttons and put marbles in jars and things like that. So there, there was no genuine commitment to helping people to work in the community. So we filed another lawsuit. Yes, we file lawsuits from time to time. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> saying, you know, you're segregating people. The whole idea behind the Americans with Disabilities Act passed in 1990, for, for you historians, was that Individuals with disabilities, those same people, those moral degenerates, had a right to live in society. Nothing more than that. They wanted, you know, they, people with disabilities have looked at the American society and said, we want some of that. That looks pretty good. Uh, don't send us off and away, because that's what has happened over time. Uh, a long tradition of out of sight, out of mind. Take people, send them to, not to be too provocative here, uh, Wapato, find a play, an old jail out in the swamps, send people off. We don't have to look at them anymore. Isn't that cool? That is the tradition of serving people with disabilities that the Americans with Disabilities Act has said, no, no, disability is part of life. And if you're getting to be my age, that's becoming more real. But just think about it, though. Think about, do, do we all like take care of ourselves and are completely self-sufficient? No, we have people in our lives who have limitations. Uh, and uh, be they because they're young or they're old or they have some type of a disability. So. The, the idea that anybody who doesn't meet a particular criteria has to be sent off somewhere else is something that the disability rights movement has fought against. Uh, and um, I will, um, and there's many examples of that. And so the things I'm gonna kind of riddle off a little bit about this are all about how we here in Oregon and elsewhere have recognized this and are working towards having a fully inclusive society. So 
let's talk about Damage uh, Hospital at Oregon State Hospital. When I first came uh, in to work at Disability Rights Oregon, it was in the mental health area. I went down to Damage, sat down with the superintendent, a really nice man, and he said, you know, Bob, we don't have rubber walls here. We can't just keep shoving people in here because every day that I have worked here, this place has been over census because everybody keeps sending us people, but there's nowhere for us to send people other than to put them on the bus back to Old Town, uh, which is kind of the way it worked back then. Uh, the, uh, when I went down to Oregon State Hospital uh, and uh, there were dark wards, they didn't keep the lights on, the primary treatment there was uh, television and cigarette smoking. It was like the most depressing place I had ever gone into. The, the chi children's wards were these cold, austere uh, uh, environments in which children who had very serious challenges uh, had there was no stimulus. It was like maybe you were my age, you went into a grade school that had green walls and very clean floors. That was the place. Um, and there was a gero psych unit, as it's called, which is where people with serious dementia and behavior problems were sent. I can't even describe the odor in those words. Uh, so that's what I confronted when I first came. Um, so over time, what we were able to do uh, was to um, close damage after a report Disability Rights Oregon did highlighting five deaths in the facility in half a year, all by neglect. Uh, and, uh, and this contributed to an effort to take the resources that were going into that facility and move them into community beds for the people who had, uh, who were not able to live at a level of, of, with supports in the community, they needed to have a group home. We created about 50% more beds that were in damage in order for those people to continue living and then to try to put some more resources into the community. That has been such a struggle. We are not even close to where we need to be there, uh, but we've made progress. Uh, so today we have something called the Oregon Performance Plan, which is an agreement with the state of Oregon to build the types of supports that are necessary in order to keep people out of crisis, keep people out of the emergency rooms, out of jail, uh, and, and fully support in the community. That's tough, uh, but that's, uh, but we are, we have made great progress, but there is much more to, to go there. Physical, people with physical and sensory disabilities, um, we, um, it, the state of Oregon sort of, even though the ADA was passed in, in 1990, the state of Oregon 25 years later hadn't got around to implementing it in terms of making its sidewalks accessible. Um, another lawsuit, I'm afraid. <laughs> we don't only do lawsuits. Uh, at Disability Rights Oregon. We, give, we help all sorts of individuals in special education to get the services they, that they need. We help people in all sorts of areas of community services get the help that they need. Uh, it's very wide ranging because disability touches us all and touches all parts of life. It spreads very broadly across society. And we really try to go to bed and understand those things because uh, we, our lawyers and people with disabilities ourselves and people who uh, work in a world that uh, in communities of people support uh, advocacy groups and, and support groups that work in these worlds in order to understand what folks need all with the same goal which is to achieve integration to achieve full participation, an opportunity for people to have a life. We shouldn't be telling people, any of our citizens, that you don't deserve to have a life because of whatever your identity happens to be. This is why disability rights are human rights. And this is <clears throat> why, um, and I get kind of choked up about this because I strongly, strongly believe it. Uh, is that um, the more we pay attention, we, the more we understand that each individual needs to have an opportunity and to have as much 
openness, not false barriers that they have to cross, uh, that we will all be better for. And again, uh, we've made progress in so many areas, but there's so much more to do. And I'm looking forward to uh, the incredible people who work in our organization and the incredible other advocates in the disability uh, world to carry on while I start dealing with fixing Social Security. <laughs> Radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Steve Novick, and we're here today with Bob Jundeff, the retiring but not shy Executive Director of Disability Rights Oregon. And before we get started, I would just like to see if we could have a round of applause for our interpreters. So, Bob, um, toward the end of my term on the City Council, we got a report that said that the city did an absolutely terrible job of hiring and retaining people with disabilities of all kinds. I was wondering if you've got some suggestions to employers out there as to what steps they can take to do a better job of hiring, retention, and treating people with respect while they're employed there. Uh, you were not alone there. Uh, and um, the thing I would say for that, as well as many things, is talk to people with disabilities. Uh, disability is, is something that, that you may not appreciate unless you've had that experience yourself. And, you know, we need to be a little humble and understand that just because we got a bunch of rules and laws, uh, that ain't going to do it. So, um, part of the, uh, quickly, part of the ADA, what I like to say, one of the, the ADA is a great law because what the ADA, ADA encourages people to do is talk to each other. Uh, and so if, if you really want to help a person succeed in employment or any other area of life, you need to talk to them about what their needs are. Other than what you've mentioned already, what are some of the projects or cases you've worked on that have had the biggest impact? Um, what projects have wound up having less impact than you had hoped or expected? And what are some issues you've worked on that people just won't have heard of? Whoa. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, the, uh, you know, like any civil rights er area, uh, their, uh, people have gone to their representatives to get laws passed to establish basic civil rights. Uh, and um, so um, I was talking about the ADA earlier. We are now 29 years, 29 years since the ADA was passed, and we are so far from having an accessible community. Uh, why? Well, we built an entire society uh, around with the idea that only certain people could participate in it. I think about the New York subways. Go to the New York subways, especially at my age, and try to negotiate that place. And that was built only for a small slice of society. But go to downtown Portland. Try to get into a store. Uh, think about this, as it just, just as an analogy. Uh, you know, we've, there's a big flap right now about uh, earthquake, uh, how older buildings can can withstand earthquakes, and having signs up. So you have you have an infrastructure that was built long before we were thinking about that. And so, what do we do now? Well, we have an infrastructure that was not built to accommodate at least 20% of our population, and the idea was that, hey, the 80% can use it, that's fine. 30 years in, where we've had both state and federal laws that say, no, actually, you know, we want everybody to have an opportunity to be included, uh, we ain't there. So in terms of challenges ahead, those, that's the one that I would uh, highlight. Uh, this might be an absurd question, but in terms of the range of types of disabilities, um, people with a mental illness, people with developmental disabilities, with physical disabilities, would you say that society has made more progress in uh, having a just society for some of those groups than others? I think uh, it's, that's an excellent question. I think that the, um, 
it depends upon how you approach it. So one, th I would say that probably the, the greatest area of challenge continues to be in the area of behavioral health, mental health and behavioral health. I remember in 2003, <clears throat> going back, that um, uh, the Oregon legislature kind of threw up its hands and said, you know, why are we spending all this money on mental health services? It's just like throwing money down the rat hole. This doesn't do any good. And they, and, and community mental health, which had struggled with insufficient funding for an incredibly long time, was cut even more. And you know what happened? Almost immediately there was a spike in people who ended up in jails and prisons. We still live with that. We take people who have mental health needs, we know they have them, we know what helps them, we are, and we relegate them into our correctional system. Uh, and it's, a, it's an absolute shame. So to me, that of, of the many challenges that we have, that's the one that we need to focus on the most. Uh, just to follow up on that, I mean, we've seen a lot of discussion in the past few years about the relationship between the Portland police and people with mental health issues. Um, would you like to, do you have some comments to make about how that discussion has gone and some points you think that have been, might have been missed? The police are being asked to be everything to everybody. Uh, it's like school teachers in a sense. It's like, you know, we expect teachers to do everything. And what, what we need to do is think about what are the proper roles? What are we really asking for? So for ex this is a, great, uh, a perfect example of where uh, we think the paradigm needs to change in the way that we've set things up in terms of, of uh, corrections and beha behavioral health needs to change. It, if our goal is to uh, make sure that we're not using our jails and prisons as uh, substitute mental health facilities. We need to have more mental health people doing outreach, uh, doing crisis response. Uh, we need to do screening at the jailhouse door so that we're not putting people in cells who are psychotic for whom. Uh, think about, think about having a major mental illness and thinking about the stress that that causes. You can't even rely upon your own mind on any given day. Mental health results in poverty. Poverty is incredibly uh, stressful. Uh, you, jail, I can tell you, is incredibly stressful. So what we do, this is, like, this is an analogy to Fairview Training Center. I'll just do it. In Fair, when I first went to Fairview Training Center, what I noticed is that we took babies who we identified as having developmental needs. They were, and we took away all the things that they needed in order to develop properly. We took away their family contacts, we took their, their ability to develop language, to develop socialization, to have opportunities to learn, be schooled, to vocational structure. We just said, you know, you have limitations, we're going to take those away. What we do with people with mental illness today is we say, hey, you're a person who has some real stress problems and challenges, so we're going to make your life as stressful as we can. <laughs> and then we expect something different from the outcome. This is ridiculous. So, um, not that I feel strongly about it, Steve. <laughs> but we need to rethink how we use our public dollars in order to serve people. Do you think it's possible that maybe people other than police should be the first responders to calls that seem to have something to do with mental health? Absolutely. I first respond, and, and police will tell you this. Uh, um, there's some real, uh, there's some, what we've done is that we've picked, uh, um, which I think is a progressive idea, is that, gee, let's find some police officers who are, have particular skills and understanding uh, in order to be first responders. Uh, well, why don't we have people who are trained professional mental health people who to be first responders. Uh, and so, and again, uh, we, if you talk to people, say, for example, from Cascadia Mental Health, they say, we know how to do this. We're really good at it. But we have about 10% of the resources that we need in order to do it effectively. Uh, we need to put those resources there. What's it like for you to do this work as a person who doesn't identify as having a disability and has 
that what that's what that's like changed over the years? Um, the yeah, that's a good question. I'll say a couple things about it. One is that um, uh, I I do not identify as a person with disabilities, and what I said earlier is that you really have to listen to people. If you are not a person in in that. Uh, who has that identity, but we have more and more people as time goes on who do have that identity, who are uh, successful professionals, who can come in, in, and do this work, and I think that you will just see that more and more. Having said that, um, um, I, I did get an honorary consumer uh, certificate uh, from my work with peer support groups uh, in the mental health area. And so um, I think I'm, um, uh, I'm at least borderline uh, <laughs> in that area. <laughs> uh, so you and your wife, Leslie, are big Bob Dylan fans. Are there any particular Dylan lyrics that have come to mind frequently as you've gone about your work? There are so many Bob Dylan uh, uh, quotes. Um, and uh, yeah, I think Leslie's been to at least 10 Bob Dylan concerts, and um, 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 yeah, that's a, you know, that's a tough one, Steve. I'll, I'll just say a hard rain is going to fall. Uh, uh, I, I am not the blue-eyed son, but, um, and we are, continue to be tangled up in blue, but we are <laughs> trying to move forward. <laughs> So, also on the lighter side, David Letterman used to have this segment called Limited Perspective, where, for example, he'd bring in a welder to critique the movie Flashdance. <laughs> I, I have a question based on my limited perspective as a one-handed guy, which is, I wonder if DRO has heard anything about the problem of long spouts uh, on soap dispensers and public restrooms. It used to be that there were short spouts, so a person with one hand could depress the plunger and put the, uh, put the soap into his or her hand. Now they've got these long spouts that extend over the sink, and I have to push the plunger and then move my hand really quickly over to see if I can catch some soap before it falls down. Is this an issue that you ever heard about at DRO? <laughs> it's a like a lot of issues that we've heard yeah. of, <laughs> about at DRO, and, and, and this, is, this is, again, uh, uh, as, as something about there's a, there's big books about accessible standards for um, for restrooms for signage for all aspects of physical construction, and they have frankly um, not always been followed. Uh, and ad, an advocacy on our part to get folks to do it, the response is often, well, gee, that would cost a little bit more in order to do that, and only and remember what I said about the eighty percent, you know, well. Uh, uh, this isn't our main market, so uh, we're not going to produce those things. Uh, universal access is something that um, that we should all be striving for, and I'll tell you, because I hurt my back last week, I'm hurting stuff more often, frankly, uh, at my age, and boy, do you realize what you can't use uh, that you thought was available to everybody uh, but now, not you know, not so much. So, um, your experience is one that that many people have, but there are solutions to it, and we will all appreciate that more. I'm going to take this opportunity to just say one more thing about that, if you don't mind. Is that is that you know, when when the world is accessible, it makes it so much easier for those of us who don't have accessibility, don't have that need because those around us can use the world more effectively. And I think about this with uh, an aging parent, for example. Boy, if the, your aging parent can go shop for themselves, if they can go to the movie theater for themselves, if you don't have to schlep them all over the place and do all this kind of stuff, that makes your life so much easier. And it also makes you sort of as you're looking forward into retirement, uh, a little more optimistic that you are going to continue to be uh, engaged in the world as you go forward, rather having be stuck uh, and isolated uh, and hopefully having one of these ingrate children actually help you out. <laughs> 
Bob, I wanted to ask you to talk a bit about the work you expect to be doing on the National Social Security Advisory Committee. And related to that, I remember in years past there were lots of legal battles over the standards uh, for getting Social Security disability for getting SSI. So I was wondering if you could address both of them. I mean, what, what's going on now? What, are, what is the state of that battle? Well, Social Security, I, I, I'm kind of uh, drinking from a fire hose uh, with Social Security. It, it's big. Uh, you know, a, a, less than a, you know, 0.05% of the people being affected by something means thousands of people. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's really important for us to be making sure that people who need these benefits get them as quickly as possible and that there's a fair way to determine who's eligible and who isn't for the disability benefits and that, and, and that these vast numbers of folks can uh, get the attention that they need um, and that it's done fairly. So what you highlight, Steve, is, is something that is continuing to be um, I would say struggle may be, well, I'll, say, I'll use the word struggle, that we need to continue to make this work as efficiently as possible and to make sure that the people who get the benefit, need the benefits, get the benefits. I'll say one more thing, another hobby horse of mine, but I think it's very important for me and something that I'm paying attention to in my social security work is that, uh, w again, going back in time, it used to be the idea was if a person had a disability and we certified them as a disability, now they were done with life. And we sent them off, they would never work again, they would never be productive, we just give them some money, goodbye. Uh, or the alternative was you're not eligible, so you're on your own. Uh, go, uh, you don't need any help, you don't need any assistance. Well, that is a false paradigm. Uh, and what we're recognizing more and more is that to the extent that we can give people opportunities to be as productive as they can, and not penalize them for being productive, but help them. Make sh if they're worried, if a person's worried about working and that they're going to lose their health insurance, for example, that's ridiculous. We need to provide people with the supports to be productive. We don't need to use our disability uh, um, benefit world to create dependency and isolation. So we need to change that whole paradigm and that's one of the things that I'm really hoping to improve when I work on this um, board. There's a very sensitive issue when it comes to mental illness which is that there are some families who have family members who clearly are in serious trouble. They hear voices, they have delusions, and they find that you can't do an involuntary civil commitment, at least as I've been told, unless you can demonstrate at the time someone goes to a judge that they're an immediate danger to themselves or others. And some of those family members feel, wait a minute, this is wrong. I know my family member needs help. Why can't I make sure they need help? What are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the, um Everybody should be able to get help when they need it, but you have to get the right help. And what we have now, again, and this is, this is we, we, we're still living with an old system in which uh, the, the public thought, or at least the idea is we have this big building and that we're gonna send people into this building and somehow they're gonna get better there. And, um, and, and in the old paradigm, they're gonna stay there forever. In the new paradigm, they'll get out at some point. So think about, um, think about uh, the things that go in, into the problem that you just identified, which is how do I identify people? How do we get them that the, the help that they need as, as early as possible in order to mitigate their symptoms? How do we assure that if people uh, are gonna need, who need a higher level of service, hospital level, go to a, how do they go to a good place? And that's actually why we fought to get rid of those old mental hospitals and have decently funded, good state facilities. And, and then what happens afterwards? If you send somebody to the Oregon State Hospital and their mental health uh, symptoms are stabilized, what happens next? Uh, and right now we have 
I will use a technical term, lousy uh, uh, set of options on that back end. And, and one of the reasons that I think it's important for us to think carefully about this is that uh, it is, there are limited resources. We have to make realistic decisions. And pushing more money into state institutions, given the amount of money we have, is a bit, in my view, is really counterproductive. Because if we don't set up the housing, the supports, community services, the crisis respite, uh, the diversion from the community, from the criminal justice system that we need, because we put, we funded a bunch more state hospital beds, we're all going to be losers. Uh, it's in time now to move to our audience questions. Again, for our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Steve Novick, and we're here today with Bob Jundef, the retiring executive director of Disability Rights Oregon. Um, and now let's see, do we even have a microphone for people to ask, ask audience questions? Yes, we do. <laughs> Good afternoon, Leslie Johnson, City Club member. I, it, this is kind of a follow-up to the last question, Mike. My experience with family is about mental health issues, and I, I grew up in Salem, not far from Damish and Fairview. We did, you know, our church group did volunteer work there. I have a vision that is not very pleasant now of what the inside of that looked like. I understand why those needed to go away, but when you live that cycle with a family member of crisis and treatment, um, and treatment makes them feel like they don't need treatment, and they're back out, and but they really can't sustain a safe and comfortable lifestyle, it still feels like we're missing a warm, safe place that we can require them to stay because they'll never be convinced that um, to make that decision on their own or you can't, you can't keep them in that place because of their condition. That loop uh, is a really hard thing to watch and that's where I see the big gap. Is there a place that we need to be creating? What, and if so, what does it look like and how do we get that movement started? The answer, I, my answer would be yes. Uh, and, uh, and what, um, but it isn't, this is one of the hard parts here is that, is, is the idea of how do you create a service or a support that a person is going to want. Uh, we are, uh, maybe someday we will be able to cure schizophrenia, uh, but we're not there yet. So uh, the question is, what type of service and support is going to be successful in helping a person genuinely? Uh, and the, um, a, and what I have seen is that there's been very successful models out there for creating that, but they do take quite a bit of resource. For example, just some ideas is peer supports to having people with lived experience of mental health to be able to help as a touchstone for people and keep, an, keep tabs on them. Uh, uh, and, and when a person has a need, if it's food or they get into trouble with their residents and these sorts of things can intervene and make sure that there's some help in negotiating the world. Part of, of facing the world, you know, I find this world com increasingly complicated personally. I, I, I thought it would be easier as I got older. It hasn't proven to be the case. And having someone who can help you who understand, who has the, an ability to relate to you and understand what you're going through in order to help in that way, I think is very powerful. Uh, and, um, but again, uh, if you look at some of the initiatives that are coming up in the, in the legislature that I think are progressive, uh, they're talking about coming up with the types of resources that are necessary to move a system forward in that direction. Uh, some of the, what I would, suggest our uh, uh, retrogressive uh, initiatives is, gee, if we could just commit people more easily and stick them into this big place, that's going to take care of things. It's not. Uh, so um, 
I think we need to be thinking about what are, what are the types of community supports that we can create for folks and stable housing, stable housing, stable housing for people to decrease their stress level, to have something that is attractive for, for folks. Uh, and uh, with, and what something else just is family support. So people who can, who have the types of, who are the natural supports for individuals to be able to learn more effectively how to relate to people and how to give them options that are uh, more attractive. Uh, I'm a city club member, Vinnie Martin, a uh, retired school psychologist. Would you comment on uh, the Disability Association's uh, activities uh, relative to uh, public education? And the, Steve had made a reference to special education. Um, uh, thanks. Um, since Disability Rights Oregon started in 1977, we have helped uh, families and individuals negotiate the world of special education. For those of you who don't know, there, uh, there are entire uh, areas of professional expertise and in every school there's services that are designed to help people who have exceptional needs to get the service, uh, get the help that they need in order to get a free and appropriate education. Uh, this has been an ongoing uh, effort because our, you know about Oregon schools, you know how well they're funded. Uh, in Oregon, uh, uh, schools get one and a half times uh, the per capita funding uh, if a kid is identified as having a disability, but the school district doesn't have to use that extra money for special education. So there's always this tension uh, in, in schools in terms of the quality of services. Special education law also requires that, that kids not only get a, an appropriate education, and that education doesn't have to be great, it just needs to be adequate. They also need to get at what's called transition services so that they can move from school to employment or their, whatever the next step is going to be for them, depending upon their level of need. Um, one of the things that we have been working on quite a bit recently, and we just filed a lawsuit. <clears throat> How did I get back to lawsuits? <laughs> About is that there's kids, oftentimes kids with autism, but kids who have real behavioral problems who can end up blowing out of their school uh, because of a meltdown or uh, that type of a problem. And there is a financial incentive right now to keep that kid out of school and send them a tutor for a day, for an hour a day, rather than do what the school districts are required to do by law, which was to do an assessment of the child, figure out how that child can be most effectively reintegrated into the school setting, and then provide the services and training for school personnel to be able to do that. Uh, this lawsuit basically says that the state has failed in its responsibilities to do that and with devastating effect not only upon those children but upon their families. Can you imagine school districts saying, hell, here's your kid, you're on your own. Uh, and, and I'll just say another thing is that <laughs> I'm a parent. I, I've got a bunch of kids. Uh, they're all grown up. But uh, when you get parents, a parent, you know, just wants the best for their child. They want their child to succeed. They want their child to have a good education. When you have a parent of a kid with disabilities, you double that because there's so many impediments for that child. And most parents will tell you that they have to fight every day in order to get that kid the services that they need. They're constantly be t being told no. Uh, and so um, uh, there, there is a... Um, uh, there is an incredible need for those parents to have the support that they need in order to uh, bat and battle it out. And, and, and if there ain't school people here, I'm not bad mouthing you. You have a lot on your plate, uh, but but those parents need also the support uh, to be able to engage and help their kids to succeed in school. Hello. 
my name is Amy Sukol and uh, I am an outreach specialist on behalf of Abilities at Work and on behalf of the organization we really do appreciate the advocacy that you offer people with disabilities. Um, Abilities at Work is an uh, over 30 year old nonprofit organization that's provided um, services and um, places people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in job, um, in job placements throughout the metro. And so my question is, how do you um, encourage employers to implement accommodations in the workplace um, for people with disabilities? And, and just as an anecdote, I just want to say that um, as an outreach specialist, uh, I encounter, well, we encounter employers who uh, are only interested in a candidate that can meet all of the job criteria, um, and, that's, and that's in the public and private sector. So. Fundamentally, how do we encourage employers to modify the workplace and understand we're also not just a temp agency, we provide long-term economic opportunity. So what would your suggestions be on uh, maybe changing or encouraging the perspective of employers that, that modifications are, are not possible? Thank you for the work that you do, first of all. I, I know that um, uh, particularly for people with intellectual developmental disabilities or, or uh, 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 that um, being employed in the community makes a, just like with the rest of us, a tremendous uh, difference in people's lives. And, uh, but that um, they may, those individuals may need more uh, accommodations, more specific accommodations to uh, make their employment uh, successful. Uh, and there's an entire group of professionals out there who, uh, who have been trained and are effective in doing job matching. So um, what I would say is, and again, going back to something I've mentioned a couple times, is disability is very individualized. And work is, and, and when you really kind of break it down, one of the fun things about disability rights, I might say, is, is that you kind of, kind of have to break down things a little bit and understand them more. And one is, well, what does, it, what does a successful uh, job match, what's, what makes that up? Now, I, I've worked at my job for a long time. There was a good job match there. Uh, my skills and my passions met what were being asked in that sense. I don't, I, my board president is here, don't talk to her. <laughs> uh, Jen Campbell, thank you, Jen. Uh, the, um, so uh, the, what I have seen as successful is that individual contact, is that the, uh, su the supported employment personnel goes out and makes the contact with the employer talks about the employer's needs, Dems has an individual who can actually fit a need for that employer and, and that liaison, if you will, is able to describe to the employer how this person will be value added for them. Uh, that can be frustrating, it can be difficult because there's a lot of education involved, but uh, many employers that I've seen take comfort in knowing that there's a person like you who is there to help if there's a problem because they may be uncomfortable or unused to someone with a particular type of disability. So thank you very much for the work that you do and I, th and I think you will continue to do that individual work in order to help a person get the proper match. My name is Don Martin. Um, there are a number of people that have multiple chemical sensitivities, and I don't know if that's kind of a new thing. I think maybe 25 years ago, people weren't talking about it. Um, does your organization have a contingency of people that suffer with that problem? And how do you see any kind of a movement or a future for fragrance and or scent-free workplaces in Oregon? Thank you for that question. And, and um, multiple sens uh, uh, chemical sensitivity is, is a challenging issue. The way that we, uh, and, and we, I would approach it in two different ways. 
uh, and yes, we do have we've had case, numerous cases over the years of people. One is just on the individual level seeking an accommodation for that person in order to allow them to work or to uh, uh, go to a public service or um, what, whatever the area that the person wants to participate in. And that's an, that's an easier lift because it's more specific. So if there is a, a, under the ADA, a person with a disability has a right to access, say a public service or a, a public accommodation as we call it, or employment, uh, and to have reasonable accommodations made for their disability. So um, sometimes that's easy. So if there is a, a, a person who has those sensitivities and they're on the job, there can be ways to modify the environment so that they can successfully be employed there. When we start talking about much broader issues like, gee, can't we make the entire world safe for uh, a sensitivity, that's a bigger lift. Uh, and I would suggest that that's a more of a policy issue than a legal accommodation issue. Uh, and the, so um, um, I, I think I'll leave it at that because that's probably the best I can address it in, short, in a short answer. Hi, I'm Colin and I'm still a City Club member. And um, I'm wondering, I'm, I look at sort of the data around, from OJSU, around more than a quarter of Oregonians live with a disability, and then I look at our legislature or our mayors across the state, um, and it seems like a far smaller percentage of folks. And so I'm wondering, how do we build power and amplify power for folks with disabilities? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm reminded of the... Um, uh, talk, I remember talking to some person who, uh, a, a, who had a store who had a bunch of stairs in front of the store and I said, well, you know, how do people with this, uh, who have mobility impairments get into your store? And he said, nobody's ever come here with a mobility impairment. Uh, it, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, Yes, you see, so in order to have more people with disabilities who are professionals, who are engaged in public life, you have to allow people with disabilities to engage in public life and start to break down those barriers for people. That's the first thing. The second thing is that disability in, uh, in many arenas is still a shameful or, uh, or, or um, uh, well, what I'm trying to th what I'm trying to get at is that, especially like in the legal profession, you know, lawyers are supposed to be strong, right, Steve? We're competent. Yeah, we're competent. We're on top of things. And boy, if somebody finds out that I have an anxiety disorder or I have a learning disorder, oh man, you know, that's going to be a problem for me. So I got to hide that. Uh, and maybe if I don't, you know. Uh, uh, have this uh, facade of, of authority about me that I am I'm going to be in a disadvantage in this world, in this very competitive world. So uh, one of the things we need to do, in my view, is to break down those attitudinal bar barriers. And one of the most fantastic ways to do that, and I'm, I don't want to call you out here, Steve, because I know Steve is a guy who's like, I, you know, he's not into being a guy with a disability particularly. Except when it comes to that bathroom soap dispenser spout issue. But you need to have people who are not held back in their lives and who, uh, in, who can step up and take leadership roles. And, um, and it's happening. Uh, and I think it'll happen more. And with that, our time is up and we have to pause the conversation for now. Please join me in thanking Mary Margaret Wheeler Weber for producing today's program, Steve Novick for moderating, and Bob Junda for sharing insights of more than 30 years of service to Oregon. Thank you.